Hey God, I thank you so much for uh, your love. I thank you for the, the worship we've been able to experience tonight and to offer to you. And it's our prayer that um, that, that worship isn't pleasing. Father, I pray that you open our minds and our hearts to receive from your word tonight. Thank you for the treasure that we have and the gift of your word. And I pray that um, we would see you and hear from you tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as you can... Grab a seat, bring the house lights up so everybody can see what's happening, and I'm telling you, there are some nights that it's hard to say that um, we didn't worship a little bit, so that was, that was good stuff back there, like crying and stuff, I don't know what that's about, um, it happens, water works and stuff. All right, so if you have a Bible, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna end White Flag tonight in a place that I think um, is going to be beneficial for everyone. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, there are no discussion group questions tonight that will be on the screen. And here's what I want you to do. I did this on purpose. If you're taking notes or you're not taking notes, I have our baskets up here. So if you find yourself tempted to, to look at your cell phone maybe a bit too much, that's not um, the Bible on your phone, Go ahead and drop that in the basket, and I'll leave that. Oh, she just made a good shot. So just walk them up quietly. Um, so what I want to do, though, tonight is I want to give you a chance to respond with your pen on paper, making discussion questions for yourself, reflecting on this whole series. Because what I, what I hope you've seen from the midst of this book, that I've been privileged enough to sit in my office and read this thing and talk to other people and, and reflect on everything that I feel that God is showing us from the book of Deuteronomy, which is not exactly the first book, first book you think of reading in the Bible. It's like, Deuteronomy, really? It's a bunch of stuff in there, like, don't kill them and make a, a refuge city, and if you and if the guy, it's weird, it's a bunch of laws. But the whole thing about the laws and the giving of this book, the retelling of the Ten Commandments, we saw that last week, is for a purpose for God to demonstrate to us what he expects from us, and then demonstrate why we will never attain that. Now, I want, you, I want you to pay very close attention. God's giving his righteous law to people who will never keep it. You ever thought about that? Like, how fair is that? Hey, God, you stack the debt against us. Like, why would you even think that's okay? And it's all for one purpose. You ready? To beg us to surrender. To lead us to a place where we have nowhere else to go but to his feet on the cross. Because there's no one else who can satisfy all of this stuff but him. That's the coolest thing that I hope you've seen from all of this. When we see a series called White Flag and we think of surrendering, what does it mean to lay down everything? Last week we looked at the difference between what was it? Devotion and surrender. Devotion is being totally sold out to an event or, or something, but that's really more emotional. Surrender is literally, I'm going to kneel before the person who, whom I am an enemy of. My, my opposition, right? It's, it's like uh, yielding a game, if you will. You ever seen a game where forfeit happens? I think of a movie, one of my favorite movies, and I'm going to totally show my nerdness, uh, The Mighty Ducks, right? Come on, right? Flying Hawks. V. Flying V. Flying V. Who are you? The Mighty Ducks, right? It's just a cool movie. It's like the underdog story, the Rudy of hockey, right? I watched Rudy yesterday, by the way. I love that movie. He's just like, yes, I'll do anything. I'll work for free. I just want to be a part of the team. Here's what happens when I say Mighty Ducks and I think about surrender and forfeit and all these things. The team doesn't show up to play a game. And the coach... Emilio Estevez and all of his coolness with his hair, he turns to the ref and he says, we forfeit. And the amount of shame that's on his face, and why does he feel shame? Well, he's a, he doesn't like to lose, right? He doesn't know what, he was a hawk, for goodness sake, right? I mean, they don't lose. And he goes to the ref and they, and they surrender, they forfeit the game, and there's this immense amount of shame that he feels. And what I want to say is, our surrender to God is totally different from feeling shame it's to finally feel rest. All of the work and everything we do, when we wave our white flag at God and say, I'm giving you everything, we kneel to our opponent. And he says, finally, welcome home. And 
shame with Jesus, no more fear. It's just him. He takes all of that away from us. I read a couple things. I like to start every message with a few quotes. This one's really good. It's by one of my favorite old man pastor preacher guys. His name's Charles Stanley. Look him up. He's in Atlanta. Um, listen, listen to what he says. This is really good. When we learn from experience, the scars of sin lead us to restoration and a renewed intimacy with God. When we experience, when we learn from that experience, the scars from that sin, here's what he's saying. It's not that you'll never feel it, but you have to learn from it. So what we're going to look at tonight, Deuteronomy chapter 30, if you have it, turn there. That's where we're going to be. And I skipped a lot of middle material because this chapter is huge in this book. Because Moses has talked to them, given them a bunch of laws, and then he comes to them and he says, and... And he's going to lead them through this process of repentance and restoration, what God promises his people. But I wanted you to hear that quote, because here's the next thing that we see. In spite of our sin, God stands ready to extend grace to us in Christ. And here's what grace means. Grace means that all of your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. Think about this for just a second. There isn't anything in your life or my life that God's going to allow me to walk through that isn't building into the purpose he has for my life and your life. Now, that doesn't mean go and sin like a goofball, okay? That's not like a license to go do what you want. That is for you to realize that God allows you to experience things, and you can still make huge mistakes. And in Christ, God works inside those mistakes for his glory, for your good. That is crazy. Why would he do that? Because he can. Because that's what grace is. Grace says that all of your mistakes, all of them, now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. Here's a prayer of repentance. Lord, change me from the inside out. And instead, what we try to do is we try to put on the fancy clothes or the right church face and we, we cover up who we are. And God... Please, will you let some holiness just soak into my inside? Because I like the way I look on the outside. If people really know who I am on the inside, man, I'm not enough. And guess what he says? He says, on your own, without me, you're not. Ouch. But you can be. You can be. Lord, change me from the inside out. So here we go. The purpose of our consequence for sin is restoration to God. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to start in verse 1, 1 through 5. Here we go. Hold on. I'm going to read really fast. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart, with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Now there's some, he says, if your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. There's a lot right there I could talk about. There's something that's going to happen to God's people. They're going to be driven. They're going to be taken into captivity, right? Doesn't happen once. Happens several times. They get overtaken by people and they drag them away. And God says that happens because of your sin, right? And this is something that's coming. There is never a thing that we do that God does not see, and there's never a sin that He will not visit the consequence on us for. I want you to hear that it's not eternal. It's here and now. You're going to feel the result of your sin. We've talked about this. And I know it's painful, and you're like, man, can I just escape that? God, I'll never do it again. Don't let me be sick. <coughs> what did he say? You're going to be sick. Because it's only through the sickness that you learn not to do it again. I can remember laying on the floor in my bedroom. God, if you will just make me feel better, I will never touch that ever again. And he said, ha, huh, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. But, what did you learn? And, I, and I, I read this passage and I go, man, 
all of the consequence for sin has a purpose in my life. And here's where it takes me. It takes me right to the feet of Jesus. Right to the feet of Jesus. Here's why I say that. If you look at verse, verse 1, he says, and, and when all these things come, he's giving them a forecast of what's going to happen. He says, I know you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Look up here at me, Every, everybody in this room. I would never ask you to be perfect. The only perfect person ever walked the face of the planet is Jesus. So when you fail, and you're going to, I'm going to, I do it every day. When I sin and fall short of God's righteous requirement of me, he calls those things to mind for me. What have I done for you? This is what he says. The blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. So not only did God allow the sin, but he, he initiates the consequence. He doesn't just say, well, I'm just going to let it go, does he? I want you to look at a couple things. It's hard to remember that God initiates our consequence for sin in order to bring us to repentance. Have you ever noticed that? Like, we want to think of God being this guy who gives good gifts, and yes, that's for sure, but I want to help you with something. The consequence for sin is also a good gift. What? Like, when I get in trouble, that's a good gift? It doesn't feel like a good gift, dude. How's that a good gift? Because, because that good gift comes upon you and you feel it, now you know what not to do. Like, don't touch the stove, son. That's hot. And what do you do? You walk up and go, and right, and then they go, I told you so. Well, much like when they say don't go there with them because you're not supposed to go there with them, you go there with them, they find out you get in trouble, and they take your car keys. Happened. A couple times. Took me a while. I'm, I'm thick-headed, right? And I don't learn things very quickly. Here's, here's the point. What God is saying in all of this, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children. Here's the point. God allows the consequence to draw us back to himself. He lets us feel the weight of our sin. See, see understanding that, that God initiates the consequences for sin is hard. But repentance, man, it's easy. <laughs> it should be. Why? Because approaching the throne of grace has been made possible through Jesus. And every eternal consequence for our sin has been rested on the Son of God. How beautiful is that to know that that thing you did today will never be visited on you in heaven. Jesus already paid for it. Thought about that? But, don't hear me say, so go and do what you want. It's not the point. Here's what it's getting at. And return to the Lord your God, verse 2, you and your children, and obey his voice. And all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. Then, it's an if, then. What is that called in, in grammar? Do you guys know what that is? If, then. It's a conditional, it's a conditional statement, right? Now, think about this. Here's what I want you to see. In Hebrew grammar, listen. This is written in Hebrew. In Hebrew grammar, this is not conditional. What? Here's why I say this. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. In the midst of dealing with the result of your choices and your sin, God comes after you for repentance. He doesn't wait and sit there and let you wallow in it. He says, come to me. I'm here, ready. Come to me. Come kneel and lay these things down. This is what surrender looks like. Here's the desired outcome of bearing consequences for sin is not shame and separation from God, from church. I, let, me, let me just... Step over here for a second. I'm just going to be honest with you. Step away from my notes. I'm just going to be completely honest. Every time I sinned and I was sitting in a room like this when I was a teenager, every time I did something stupid, I felt it from the people I was with. I felt it from my church friends first. You know why? You know what we just did? Did you hear what we did this weekend? And I would come into a room, and every time I would come into the room, I could feel it, right? Like the looks. You know you really don't want to sit. Parents, don't let your kids be friends with him because he's bad news, right? You probably should date him, ladies, because I know him, right? All of those things were happening to me. And what do you think that was? Do you think that was God's intention to push me away from a youth group? To push me out of church? 
Absolutely not. Here's what it's for. It's the desire of God that we return to him as the life-giving, sustaining Savior that he is. It's not to alienate us from the body, but to correct us and draw us in. But I want to help you with something. If you are that person in the room who feels and wrestles with the weight of your choices, and you don't feel welcome, <coughs> the playing field is level at the feet of the cross. There's no one in this room who's worthy to be with Jesus. But, those of you in the room who make them feel unwelcome, remember for what you've been forgiven. It's a whole lot easier on the other side of grace to cast judgment on people. But when you haven't felt it, be careful. Be very careful. See, the purpose of the pursuit of God and allowing us to feel the consequence for our choice is to bring restoration, not condemnation. Because in Christ there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? We know that. We say that. But why don't we let it reign in our hearts? I want you to look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. There's this there's this unique phrase in here that is, is found in a few places in the Old Testament, but I love this right here because it comes right after verse 5. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Here's what he's saying. The prescription is not just given by God, it's performed by Him. What's necessary inside of us, the heart change that is required, you can't manufacture that. There's nothing inside you and me that can make us love God any more or any less. The approach comes when God pursues us and then we stop and we surrender and, he, and we finally recognize who he is. So he does the work. Look at what he says. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love him. So outside of a work of God in my life and in your life, we will never love God enough for him, for him to be acceptable of it. It just doesn't work. God has to move on us because we don't love God naturally. We've talked about this all this year. Something about us is not love God because we want to be God. All of our religious actions can be used to display a heart for God, but they will not be enough to manufacture a heart for Christ. Let me say that again. All of our religious actions can be used to display a heart for God, but they will not be enough to manufacture a heart for Christ. The only way we have a heart for Christ is if God begins to work in us. When he says that the love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live, he is giving them a promise for a future, not for shame, but to live in a guaranteed future. If the process if the purpose of consequence for sin is restoration to God, then the process begins with Christ in us. So look at verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. I want to stop right there. I want to say something. If Christ is in us, listen to this. Hold, hold on to this. If Christ is in us, we can never say it's too hard to follow God. What? Well, it's hard, right? You guys, you guys fail today? <laughs> Amen. You fail this week more than once. Today is like a list. If you if, like think the tallies, like I was watching um, Star Wars Episode Seven, and she's chilling inside the little thing, the walker, right? And she's tracking the days that she's been left alone. She doesn't make the cry. It bothers me. She doesn't make the little line for five. Like it's just a bunch of lines. She's counting the days. Imagine what that would look like for the for the for the inventory of our sin. There isn't enough metal to scratch. You thought about that? On the face of the planet, if we were to list our sins and count them, there isn't enough metal to scratch. But, 
Jesus. But with Jesus, God takes that scratched medal and he says, I remember that no more. I remember that no more. And all that, all that stuff that you did today, all that stuff that you did last year, all that stuff you did, and in Christ, he says, I see my son. I don't see your sin. Now, I want to be very careful with something here. Although this scripture does say, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not to heaven that you should say, who will, descend, who will ascend to heaven for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Look at verse 14. But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. The word is near to you. The word is near to you. Not just this word of God. In Christ, the incarnate word, the Son of God, has taken up residence in you. He's not far from you. He is in you. And you can do everything that he says do. Unfortunately, we choose not to. I heard a talk show host uh, this week. I, was, I listened to a bunch of podcasts, and it's really nerdy, but I do it. And here's what he said. He said, I have heard God speak, and everyone in this room, if you are a follower of Christ, you will probably identify with this. He said, I hear God speak sometimes, and I choose not to go. And I choose to do my own thing. And here's what he says. It hurts every time. Every time. And God has a way of taking our life and letting it function around us in such a way until we follow and submit to God. He will let you go your own way, but he will make you miserable in the process. Anybody ever experienced that? Like, God, I know you're talking to me from the scripture. I know you're calling me to something, and I know what I'm good with. I'm comfortable here. God, don't call me over there because I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too big. And he says, I'm in you. What I call you to, you can do. Go do it. And we stand there like we own ourselves, and we say, no, I'm not going to do it. And he says, yeah, watch how this works. See how effective you are over here. I heard a guy uh, speak. I have a quote from him. I wanted to to read his name is David Platt. Some of you guys may know his name. Here's what he says. If, if you can trust God to save you for eternity, you can trust him to lead you for a lifetime. If, if those of you in this room who have bowed your knee to Christ and surrendered, if you've given him your eternity, why won't you give him your every day? Why do we feel that we are the masters of our own destiny? Here's the problem. If that's our, if that's our position, I'm in charge of me right now, God, I'm looking to you for heaven, then we'll probably miss heaven. Because he's probably not Lord in your life. Ouch. But if we can trust him for our eternity, we can trust him for a lifetime. Day to day. Every step. Now what's the next step? The word is very near to you. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. This isn't in my notes and it won't be on the screen, but man, I just... I feel like we gotta read this. Three of you are coming to series. I get there. All right. Colossians chapter one, verse fifteen. The word. Hold on to this. Verse fourteen of Deuteronomy thirty. Put your finger there and then turn over. The word is very near you. Look at verse fifteen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and all things, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. John chapter 1. Turn back. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of Him. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word is very near you. If you are a Christ follower, he is in you, living inside you. It is not too hard to follow 
We just have to choose. And here's the last point. The offer of restoration comes from God, but we decide what to do with it. Verse 19. This is huge. Uh, man, this is such a good set of verses. Moses steps up in front of them, and then he announces this oracle for God. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you. Listen to this. Everyone, listen to these words. Read them on the screen. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. That you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life in the length of days. Students, let me ask you, adults in the room, is he your, your strength? Is he your purpose? Do you wake up every morning, and before you check your phone, before you get a bath, before you do whatever it is, do you stop and say, God, thank you for being my purpose? Jesus, thank you for saving me. I'm giving you this day, fresh and new, before I start. Choose life. Here's my hand. When did it become common to think that our choices to follow God or not follow God don't matter? When did it become so easy to say, no, I don't like that one, I'm just going to not do that one, but I like everything else that you said? He didn't give them a choice. I've put before you life and death, blessing and curse. So here's my question. Everybody in the room, what have you chosen? Have you chosen life? Are you still going to stand as an enemy of God and shake your fist at him and say, this is my life, I'm going to do what I want, and he's saying, I bought you with a price, you're not your own, let me in. Let me take your mess. Let me take what's broken and make it work. Here's the same quote that I quoted a minute ago. If you can trust God to save you for eternity, you can trust him to lead you for a lifetime. One is infinitely longer than the other. So why would we settle for less? And I start studying this passage last Thursday. And all week, it's sitting, rolling around in my brain and in my heart. And I thought to myself, why has it become easy for me to choose which things I like about God and which things I don't when he calls me to the hard things? When he calls me to surrender my, my goals for life. When did it become so cavalier to ignore him? Failing to acknowledge Jesus is no less dangerous than anything in the world. When you think the scariest thing in the world that terrifies you, your biggest fear. Somebody asked me that this week. It's a big question. What's your biggest fear? I have several. <laughs> One has to do with like ugly painted faces. Clowns. Here's my, here's my, I want, I want to close with this. Whatever your greatest fear is, whatever your greatest fear is, magnify it by infinity, and that's the danger you face by refusing to follow Christ. I can't stress this enough. There's nothing in this world worth more than surrendering to Him. There's nothing you're going to give up that will work more than Him. Never has been anything, never will be anything greater than Jesus. So why do we settle for less? I pray that all of us in this room have stopped and bowed before the King of Kings and said, I surrender. You are my King. I'm not anymore. It does, the offer does come from God. We have to choose what to do with it. I pray that we would choose life. Here's where life is found. I found um, a passage in Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. If you want to turn there, you can. 5 through 13. Just read. Just I think it, I think I have it. Uh, yeah. I have it up on the screen. But I want to read something to you, how this ties together from Deuteronomy to Romans. Okay, listen to what he says. For 
Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. All we've seen so far to this point is a bunch of laws and rules that God says, follow these, and we just know we can't. That the person who does the commandments shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Not one. He's never let anybody down, and he never will. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. So I, I mentioned in our prayer time, I'll close with this. I mentioned in our prayer time, my mom's best friend, her name's, uh, her name's Carol, basically my aunt. I've known her my whole life. Um, not biological, but we're going to have ghosts. My best friend's parents we call him aunt, right? So, aunt Carol's husband, Uncle Roger, um, about eight years ago, was diagnosed with intense um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So much so that his body has stopped functioning and he can't even remember how to swallow a natural reflex. So about a week ago he stopped eating. Um, they sent him into uh, an end of life facility and I talked to my mom today days maybe and here's my greatest fear and I'll miss it. And I didn't tell him about this. Seriously, like, people die every day, and they never respond to Jesus. Now, I trust that Roger is a believer. I've known him for a long time. He loves Jesus. I know that. But I wonder, do we have a burden for those around us? As we walk every day, wherever our feet take us is our mission field. I wonder if we stop to think that the gospel that saved us is also sending us take it to other people? Could it be that someone in this room, I don't know, I don't know maybe this message is for, is for me, but what, what I do matters. My posture before the Lord matters. What I do with his message matters. So as I look at this series in the book of Deuteronomy, we look at what it means to surrender. How have you surrendered? Have you surrendered? What's keeping you from doing it? Those are your reflection questions, not discussion questions. Can you? Have you responded in chosen life? I want to pray. Um, Van, you don't need to come back, but I just want to pray. And close this out. They took my clock down, so my apologies. It's gone. Everybody look. something? I just, I just want to do something. Right, let's stand up together. And as, and as, as quietly as, as you can, just, just pray. You don't have to pray out loud. Just, let's, let's close our time in prayer. We only do corporate prayer. But as we stand, we acknowledge the King. Huh? Allow Him to search your heart. Have you surrendered to Him? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your love extended towards us on the cross. Father, I, I, tell, I, I admit, I confess that there's nothing good in me except for you. There's nothing there's nothing about me worthy of being saved and forgiven. But you did it anyway.
Maybe somebody in this room is, is wrestling with surrender. What does it look like in their life? What are they holding on to? Have they not given up? Why? Why won't they repent and turn and trust you? God, I pray that uh, tonight could be the night they, they settle things run from you for a long time and today is the day that they're going to settle. Thank you for this awesome night of worship that we've had. Thank you for the treasure of your word that shows us Jesus. Our Savior and Sustainer and Lord Jesus. Thank you for it. Um, thank you for this time we've had in this room. Go this now. Keep us safe. Bring us back together again soon on Sunday as we prepare to engage our community with the good news of Jesus that's by knocking on doors and